Hi, my name's Tracy. And my question is, are we morally obligated to help the poor? Between now and tomorrow morning, 40,000 children will starve to death. The day after tomorrow, 40,000 more children will die, and so on. In a world of plenty, the number of human beings dying from suffering, from hunger, malnutrition, and hunger-related diseases is staggering. According to the World Bank, over one billion people at least, one quarter of the population, live in poverty. Over half of these people live in South Asia. Most of the remainder in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. The contrast between these people and the population of the rich nations is a stark one. In the poor nations of South Asia, the morality rate among children under the age of five is more than 170 deaths per thousand, while in Sweden it is fewer than 10. In Sub-Saharan Africa, life expectancy is 50 years, while in Japan it is 80. The president of the World Bank, Jim Young Kim, recently announced the goal of eliminating extreme poverty by the year 2030. Kim noted that there are 1.3 billion people living in extreme poverty. 870 million will go hungry every single day. And 6.9 million children under the age of five who die every year as a result. Kim concluded that helping the poor is a moral imperative. Moral imperatives establish duties and obligations. If Kim is right that there is a duty to help the poor, then it is wrong to not help them. If there is a duty to help the poor, we should feel guilty when we are not helping them. Giving aid to the poor other nations may require some inconvenience or some sacrifice of luxury on the part of people from rich nations. But to ignore the plight of starving people is immorally reprehensible as failing to save a child drowning in a pool because of the inconvenience of getting one's clothes wet. Billions of people live on less than $2.50 a day. That's a day. What we pay for a cafe latte or an ice cream treat, they live on daily. Should we feel guilty for indulging in such luxuries while children die of deprivation? Most of us do not feel guilty as we spend money on trivial luxuries. Perhaps we are morally clueless. It is easy to ignore suffering that is hidden in distant places. However, the more plausible explanation is that people do not agree with Kim that helping the poor is a moral imperative. What is the extent of our duty to poor nations? Every week, more than a quarter of a million children die from malnutrition and illness. Many of these deaths are preventable. For example, Diarrhea and respiratory infections claim the lives of 16,000 children every single day and could be prevented by 10 cent packets of oral rehydration salts or by antibiotics usually costing under a dollar. The aid needed to prevent the great majority of children's illness and death due to malnutrition in the next decade is equal to the amount spent by the U.S. to advertise cigarettes. It is well within the capacity of rich people of rich nations as collectives or as individuals to prevent these avoidable deaths and to reduce this misery without sacrificing anything of comparable significance. Personalizing the argument, Peter Singer, a contemporary philosopher writes, just how much we will think ourselves obligated to give up will depend on what we consider to be comparable moral significance to the poverty we could prevent. Color television, stylish clothes, expensive dinners, a sophisticated stereo system, overseas holidays, a second car or a larger house, private schools for our children. None of these is likely to be comparable significance to the reduction of absolute poverty. We think it would be nice to help the impoverished. However, charity is not obligatory. We might also think that global poverty is simply not our own fault. If we have done something, nothing wrong, then we should not feel guilty or blameworthy. Most people would agree that there is a duty to help those whom we have wronged or harmed. If I am riding on someone else's back, I have an obligation to get off their back. If I am somehow contributing to the problems of the poor, then I might be blamed for their plight. However, are middle-class Americans riding on the backs of the globally poor? 
We do benefit from cheap consumer goods and resources that are produced and extracted by world's working poor. Poor, poor people working in dangerous conditions, for example, most likely major clothes. Last year, a garment factory burned down in Bangladesh. Clothing manufactured there was for American brands. More than 100 people died in that fire. According to the New York Times, the minimum wage for workers in that factory was about $40 a month. That's just over $1 a day. Poor people may have died because of dangerous working conditions. Manufacture the clothing that we wear. Does that create an obligation on our part? Alternatively, is that just the result of free market or economics? Thomas Pogue, an ethics professor from Yale, discussed this question at a meeting of the American Philosophical Association. Pogue received a prize for an article where he argues that the international system unjustly violates human rights of the world's poor. Pogue thinks that injustices on the global economic structure create an obligation to the poor. He admits that failing to save people is not as bad as killing them. Nevertheless, Pogue claims that we are not simply failing to save the poor. Instead, he claims the international system is rigged against them. From Pogue's perspective, we are riding on the backs of the global poor, actively contributing to their poverty. Affluent nations extract profit and resources from poor countries, while poor countries cannot overcome the headwind created by international systems. We should get off their backs and compensate them for their predicament. It might be that if we did not purchase products manufactured in foreign sweatshops, we would further impoverish the global poor. It might also be that donations to the poor cause dependency and corruption. Those practical concerns do not weaken the moral claim that we have an obligation to the poor. We need to be careful and strategic as we readjust global economic priorities. Proprieties, priorities, yeah. The president of the World Bank appears to agree with the ethics professor that there is moral obligation to create a world free of poverty. As you sip your $3 coffee, you might insist that the global economy is none of your business. However, there is a growing consensus that it is our business to be concerned about the affliction of those whose labor fills our cup. In the coming decade, the gap between rich nations and poor nations will grow and appeals for assistance will multiply. How the people of rich nations respond to the plight of those in poor nations will depend in part on how they come to view their duty. Duty to poor nations, taking into account justice and fairness, the benefits, harms of aid and moral rights, including the right to accumulate surplus and the right to resources to meet basic human needs. Finally, all human beings have dignity, deserving of respect, and are entitled to what is necessary to live in dignity, including a right to a life and a right to the goods necessary to satisfy one's basic needs. This right to satisfy basic needs takes precedence over the rights of others to accumulate wealth and property. When people are without the resources needed to survive, those with surplus resources are obligated to come to their aid. Again, by Peter Singer, he quotes, I begin with the assumption that suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. My next point is this. If it is within our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it.